we all have some generalized idea of what an atom actually looks like, whether it be that of a planetary model or something a little bit more complicated. You've seen them before. You have this idea or this generalized trend to what they should look like. But where did that model actually come from is a little bit more complicated than just drawing a bunch of spheres. The timeline of history of atomic overview dates back to antiquity or the times of the ancient Greeks and all the way through into the early 20th century. And even then, we've been altering or changing the atomic model each and every day. Now, as we get through this, you'll realize there are large gaps in history, as we sort of talk about. But we're going to focus on a couple scientists and developments that they sort of came up with along the way. In order to make some true sense out of this, though, we have to have a generalized understanding of what has happened in society over time. And so when we talk about things like antiquity, we're talking about the ancient empires, first the Greeks, then the Romans, and then the development of thought and advancement in society. Now, keep in mind during these, you know, empirical times, what we're looking at is this idea that these large empires would spread out across the world. And by the world, we mean the Western society where we have recorded history in taking place throughout most of Europe. And as they spread out and went from place to place, they usually adjusted or sort of absorbed cultures and movements and thoughts and became part of their own. One of the classic examples you can think of is when the Roman Empire conquered, conquered the Greeks, they took many of their um, the Greek gods and sort of gave them almost Roman titles uh, that had very, very similar traits. Uh, Heracles was actually the original Hercules, believe it or not. And if you don't believe me, talk to your history teachers, they can get more into this. But this particular era of time of antiquity is, you know, full of thought, full of process, full of development. And then something really, really important happens in 476 AD. Rome falls officially. The empire is gone. And from 476 AD to almost about 1800, we've really got nothing to show as far as the, the timeline of the modern day uh, atom, what it looks like. Because during that time, we basically had something known as the Middle Ages. Rome's gone. There's no unifying empire, and so knowledge doesn't usually get passed down from generation to generation. Knowledge is almost lost from time to time. And you're looking at countries that are essentially constantly at war with one another. I mean, you could think Game of Thrones, but there's nothing cool about it. There's just the death and despair part. Then you throw in the Black Death, the mini Ice Age, and there, there just was not a lot to look forward to in the Middle Ages. So what starts to happen is the church, specifically the Roman Catholic Church, fills the void. Now, there's good things about that, and then there's things that are not great about science for that. One of the most important parts about that is the Bible is used for intellectual understanding. Whether that be good or bad, what happens is that survival dominates life. People don't care so much about thinking about the atom. What they're looking at is basically just trying to figure out, okay, how do I get from day to day? The Renaissance and scientific revolution and Protestant reform, all of these happen concurrently, you know, close into like the early 1300s. But beyond that, what starts to happen is the church starts to alter. They start to go away from attacking all of Europe. And instead, they're trying to reclaim the Holy Land and inadvertently start attacking most of Asia, um, which is a good thing for Europe, but not a great thing for Asia. So Europe's, Europe basically stops destroying itself in, to reclaim the Holy Land. And civilization actually roots back up into antiquity. Some of the ancient uh, thoughts and processes start to come back. But instead of an emperor, what we have now, since the church is dominating this, is you have the pope. And what's different about an emperor and a pope is that a pope is believed to be an infallible leader. Um, think North Korea. Uh, that's generally the, the sort of the idea here is that the leader cannot make mistakes because the leader is chosen by God in this case. However, literacy rates skyrocket. And that's because the church is very, very concerned with the spread of word. Um, and so they have to basically educate people as well as they can to read the Bible. And it becomes, you know, all of these reformations to get people literate in reading the Bible. Scientists, on the other hand, even though literacy rates are going up, um, most of the work that they do, if it's, you know, against what has been believed uh, or has said or been shared by the church, they risk excommunication or even worse, death. So the gains in science in this particular era don't help too much. Finally, we break off and the church sort of starts to lose its power. There's a lot of reasons for this to happen, but as this happens, we have these secular nation states. Um, and these nation states start to develop their own governments. And now government starts to become the shift of the ones in control. And this is a good thing for free thought, 
it's not a great thing for uniformity because they start to develop these national scientific academies, but only the rich, powerful, wealthy are actually allowed to participate. So alas, we're still not passing down information from year to year. And so if you look at it from antiquity all the way to 1800, we have almost nothing to show for ourselves because we're not passing information down from generation to generation for the masses. You're doing it in small little groups. And so things are being lost along the way. The Industrial Revolution hits us. Now we have a bombardment of all this information. Education takes reform because we have to train workers to be ready to go into factories is essentially what happens. And so if you think about your education model right now, you're actually built off this idea of we're sort of training you in place so that you will go into a factory and work. Now, there's a problem with that. Um, the factories' jobs don't exist as much anymore as they used to. So uh, the post-industrial revolution era, which is what we're in right now, um, education is not totally fixed along this. However, science becomes really, really important. And so if we look at the atom and how the atom started only to make this more specific, the first true person to write, write something down related to the smallest possible pieces is the ancient Greek Democritus. And you can see he lived from 460 to 370 BC or BCE, before the Common Era. So before Christ is what that would stand for in the Roman Catholic Church belief system. And he says this, if you take anything and you cut it in half, think, I don't know, let's do a large cake. We cut the cake in half and then we cut the cake in half again. So now we've got quarters. Okay, let's take one of those quarters and we'll cut that quarter in half. Okay, now I've got an eighth. We'll keep cutting it in half. I've got a sixteenth. Cut the sixteenth in half. And you could go further and further and further. Now, eventually, you will reach a point that when you go to cut the piece of cake in half, it doesn't cut. You get to the point of the smallest possible piece. And that piece is so small, it's indestructible. And that indestructible piece, the word for indestructible in Greek was atomos is the atom. And Democritus sort of coined this up with this idea, but no experimentation. Think of a forum where you're sitting together just talking. And he even said there were different kinds of atoms. Water had these smooth, round atoms, and iron had these rough, sticky ones that sort of smushed together. And then Aristotle says along the way, you know, I don't buy the whole atom thing, but I do believe that there's some elements. And he doesn't really think that Democritus has this great idea of like, yeah, maybe the smallest possible piece, but he thinks things are all mixed with varying forms of the four elements. So earth, air, fire, and water. Turns out none of those are actually elements, but you know, over four, it's okay. And if you're looking at hot things, dry things, cold things, and wet things, it's just a variety of mixtures of the four elements. And again, it's a thought process that he's looking at. And this is antiquity. You know, we're 2,000 plus years ago. We're not experimenting. We're just thinking along the way. And so if you look at kind of what happens in the timeline, and this is almost sad to look at, the atom is sitting down here at the edge. Like Democritus first starting to look at what the atom would actually be were almost 5,000 years ago. Well, I guess with Democritus, it's closer to 3,000. But the Egyptians had similar philosophies as well. And I call this blue era all the way up to about the fall of Rome when you had this empirical time. It's this philosophical region where the thought process is dominating. We're not experimenting, we're just thinking, and we're just talking. But there's not education for the masses, so you're not passing a lot of information down either. And when Rome falls and we hit the Middle Ages, well, now there's this constant battle of, like, who's going to be the most powerful? Because there's no longer an empire. And so you lose even more knowledge, but something fascinating pops up, alchemy. And so if you think of almost every secret society, the Knights Templar, um, I don't know, the Freemasons, everything that exists comes out of that alchemy era and the Crusades and sort of going back and forth between Europe and Asia and finding this all-knowledge all power. And there's this fascination with higher thinking and logic from the philosophical era, but now they were experimenting. Now, were their experiments perfect? No. And to be honest with you, I can't even share with you a bunch of alchemists because it was such a secret because if they were found out by the church, they were usually killed. But these sorcerers and sorceresses that showed up in the alchemy era, something really important did happen on accidents. They got really good with glassware and they got really, really good with measuring because what happened was if I walked into class one day and said, hey, I just figured out how to make gold from lead. Well, the masses would usually say, all right, well, can I have some gold? Can I have some gold is the wrong question though, because now you're relying on me. The true question is, how'd you do it? 
Because if you can figure out how to do it, you don't need me. You can do it yourself, and then you have the power or the knowledge that be. And so what happens is alchemist to alchemist start sharing these formulas, these representations, this inner me meaning to all this life on here. And they start to experiment, and more importantly, they start to replicate. And this is why it gets so screwy with measurements, because we're in secular nation states here. No one's doing the same thing. We're in the Middle Ages. There's no unifying empire. So one country measures one way, one country measures another way. And so we start to develop like the foot as a standard measurement. At the same time, the meter is developed. And so this is the, the origin of all of this mess is that without an empire, you don't have standardization. And that finally takes us all the way to the Industrial Revolution when the atom actually starts to change. And the first one that sort of comes up with it is John Dalton. And if you look at the date here, it's 1803, so we're early 19th century. And John Dalton basically says, hey, you know what? I'm studying the atmosphere. I'm studying meteorology. I'm looking at the skies and the gases that exist. And I find out that for every you know, one oxygen and two hydrogens that come together, I make a water. And I can see that there's equal whole ratios where this happens. There's an atom of oxygen and there's two atoms of hydrogen that makes one molecule of H2O. And we go from 16 and 2, or a total mass of 18, to a total mass of 18. But if you look at his atom, his atom is the exact same atom Democritus had. It's some indestructible circle. Well, we should probably say sphere in this case. And there's nothing special about it. It's just a sphere. That's all there is. And you know, certain atoms have different masses, and they combine in whole ratios. And actually, there's a huge debate about whether or not he stole this information from an Irish chemist at the time. but John Dalton sort of wins the battle of history and becomes known as the father of modern day chemistry. And if you look at what he's done, he has the exact same mo model Democritus had more than 2000 years prior. So now, almost 100 years later, we have the first true movement to change the atomic model. J.J. Thompson in 1897 has been playing with something called a cathode ray tube. And a cathode ray tube is sort of described as such. You essentially have this chamber full of gas where you're connecting it to a battery or really a power supply. Now, what's unique about this is if it's actually full of gas, the cathode and anode, or sort of the negative and positive sides of this tube, don't actually conduct electricity. And so you hook up the battery and nothing can go through. So what makes Thompson unique is he finds a way to evacuate the chamber. In other words, he's basically going to pull out as much gas pressure as he possibly can. He's going to drop this down to 0 0.0001 millimeters of mercury, or a really small pressure, almost nothing. And what happens is now it's conductive, and he creates this beam that travels from the cathode to the anode. And what he finds out is that this beam that's actually conducting across is what he calls a cathode ray. Now he's curious about what exactly is in the cathode ray. And so he sort of starts to play with it a little bit and puts some other objects inside this cathode ray tube. So if he puts a disc inside there, he finds out, hey, no matter what I do, all these cathode rays travel in straight lines, which is unique. And so you can see a shadow being cast there to indicate that it's always shining in the exact same straight line. It does curve, doesn't deflect. It actually has some momentum. If he places a wheel inside there, it possesses some kinetic energy to turn the wheel which is unique as well. But the most important part for us is not so much that it goes in a straight line or that it has some of this kinetic energy. It's what happens when we expose it to an electric field. The ray bends toward a positive charge. So what that means is that ray must be the opposite. And so what the data actually shows us is that this beam, these particles that are coming through have these negative charges. And what he finds out accidentally, or I guess not accidentally, more purposeful, is that the atom itself has pieces inside of it that are smaller than the atom. So that indestructible sphere that we've left with almost 3,000 plus years right now is completely gone. Now we have something that actually has some tinier pieces to it that happen to be negative. And so he's like, okay, we'll take the existing sphere and we'll draw some negatives in. And he calls this idea the plum pudding model. He is a British, British scientist and plum pudding is something that most people actually are aware of. But I don't know about you, I've never actually had plum pudding. So sometimes they call it the chocolate chip cookie dough model, where the chips are the negative charges and the positive goo is sort of the dough. But another way to think about it is a watermelon, or a watermelon with seeds, more likely. Those individual seeds are the electrons kind of sitting inside the mesh of the watermelon, which is the positive charge. And so that positive charge is evenly distributed all throughout. And there's little electrons kind of sitting in between everywhere. 
So then a couple of years later, a student of Thompson's, because remember, if we're looking at these scientific societies that exist, it's sort of the clout and uh, having a lot of, you know, money, wealth, and power to pass on this information. Ernest Rutherford comes along and wants to add on and sort of test out uh, Thompson's model. And so what he does is he actually does something called the gold foil experiment. And so Thompson's model is suggesting that these electrons are sort of sitting in this positive goo. So if we can imagine almost a proton just kind of sitting small next to these electrons, or this watermelon where you have these seeds sitting in the coalesced form of the positive. Rutherford comes in and says, I'm going to use this alpha particle. Now, an alpha particle is a radio radioactive particle that just has a positive charge. And he shoots it directly at this gold foil. And instead of going straight through, it bounces. Now, this animation is perfect because it's showing way too many of them bouncing. Most of them went directly through and didn't interact at all. And that's because he finds out, you know what, the positivity of the atom must be somewhere centralized. It actually should be smaller than that. He expected to see this, where everything just kind of flew through and didn't interact at all. But because this didn't happen and we saw deflections, he argued, you know what, there's something else to this besides just having positive goo. And so what the data shows us on here is that Rutherford, he was expecting that those particles would pretty much just fly straight through the gold foil. Because if Thompson's model is correct, that positive charge is going to essentially not interact with these really fast moving alpha particles, which are positively charged. But what was weird is that they bounced back, not all of them, but a few of them, and they bounced right back. And he almost akin to just saying it was like shooting a cannonball essentially at a piece of paper and seeing the cannonball bounce back right at you. That's very bizarre. It's not something he expected. And so because of this, he changes it around a little bit. And he says, if we're talking about Thompson's model as plum pudding or the watermelon or essentially the chocolate chip cookie dough, we should have seen them all go through. But that must not be the case. We must be thinking, you know what? The vast majority of the atom is empty. There's nothing there. And all the positivity of the atom is actually sitting in the center. That's the only way that this positive charge could have bounced off and bounced back at him or deflected to the side. And so Rutherford calls this kernel of positivity the nucleus, because as you'll find out, or if you remember from biology class, the nucleus or biological discoveries and all these taking place are kind of happening along the same time as these atomic discoveries are taking place, which is why they have sort of the same name. And then in 1913, Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist, goes a step further with the atom and actually starts ionizing elements. And what's interesting about the ionization of elements is he starts to look at these elements as giving off various types of light. And he uses a slit or sort of a grading pattern so he can separate them into what's called spectral lines. So hydrogen, for example, if you ionize it or electrify it, you only get a couple spectral lines. You get a red, a blue, and a violet usually in, in place. And that's nice because it's usually pretty helpful to identify it as hydrogen. Whereas helium, the second element on the periodic table, it's a very, very different set of spectral lines. And it's almost this colorful barcode that helps us identify. Okay, so if we use the Bohr model of the atom, you can see that we have just the nucleus sitting in the center with, well, this is showing protons and neutrons, which we haven't got there just yet, but the electrons slowly orbiting around. And so what I can do is I can cause this electron to change orbits. So let's say I wanted to jump to the next orbit. I'd send some kind of light in and it'd be excited. Now, eventually, what will happen is if I wanted to jump back down, which it will do on its own because it will want to reach the nucleus as close as possible, in order to make that jump, it would need to release its excess energy, which it does so in the form of light, and we get a spectral line. Now, the bigger the jump, the more powerful the energy. And so if we jump all the way from the spectral line, or sorry, if we jump all the way from the left outer energy level to the first, we're going to release a lot of energy. And in some cases, that energy is in the purple or the ultraviolet or even past into like the X-rays, gamma rays, and what we can see. But some of these other jumps, like for example, if I was going to jump to orbit three and then just jump down to orbit two, we can see smaller jumps or less energy closer to the reds. And we get these individual pieces that are called spectrum or spectral lines. And the lines indicate all the possible jumps of every possible location that we can see in the visible light spectrum. Of course, keeping in mind the visible light spectrum is only a small portion of the spectrum because, in truth, the visible light spectrum that we look at is only 
the tiny fraction of all the light that possibly exists. So spectral lines could go on further and further, but we have enough to identify atoms just by using these individual lines to tell them separate from one another. Now those spectral lines were hard to explain using just Rutherford's model because Rutherford sort of said it was a planetary model and that the electrons are orbiting around. Bohr goes a step further and says, you know what, in order for this to happen, the electrons need to be doing something like this. And so this idea of light being given off by electrons falling down to lower energy levels is basically stating that electrons can only be found in certain specific pathways, which are indicated by their barcode or their spectrum. And the identity of the electrons can actually be shown from the spectrum of an element. And so he changes the model slightly. And he says, you know what, there's still a nucleus, but the electrons are actually on these specific pathways or quantum energy levels that they cannot exist between. So it is still kind of a planetary model, but they can't jump halfway. They either jump up or they jump down. Now, this is something we look much further at later in the year when we start talking about the occupation or the levels of where these electrons actually are. So then in 1926, uh, you've got the race really to develop the atomic bomb at this point. Um, I guess this is technically before that, but we're getting very, very close. A uh, German physicist you know, runs some calculations and finds out that you know, if in fact the electrons were orbiting, like Bohr was suggesting, even at these various quantum levels, they would crash into the nucleus and completely explode. So what they're actually doing is really, really complicated. Um, you could almost think about it as that they're everywhere and nowhere all at once, moving incredibly fast, and you can't know its position or its, or sorry, you can't know its position and its momentum at the same time, which is bizarre. And so there's this person named Erwin Schrodinger who comes up with this idea that the Electron has a probability of being in a certain location, which tends to be the exact same locations that Bohr came up with. However, it's not in an orbit. It's sort of this cloud of probability. So what do we have to know about this? Well, all we really have to know is that if someone were to ask you, do electrons orbit like the planets? The answer is emphatically no, they can't. They would crash, and crash into the nucleus and we would not have matter. So electrons do not orbit like the planets. What are they doing? That's for a later time. And finally, James Chadwick in 1935 uh, builds off of a lot of the foundations of Rutherford and comes up this idea of sort of determining, you know, where is this arbitrary mass coming from? So we have Rutherford's idea that the centralized location of the nucleus is positively charged. Um, and researchers end up starting to figure out, you know, there might be something else in there besides just a proton because the masses aren't working out exactly right. I mean, we're suspecting these to be in whole numbers. And so we're saying, okay, well, maybe the mass is just the protons and the electrons. But we all know that the electrons at this point are really, really light as compared to a proton. And so there's starting to be some conflicting data in this. And so we start to develop this idea of like, okay, well, a helium is the second element. So you figure a helium should be twice as big as a hydrogen atom. And when you go and run the experimental data, you find out, okay, two, um, no, it actually is not balanced out. It's more like four hydrogens for every one helium, which makes it really, really strange because if helium only has two protons, then why is it like that? So in 1932, James Chadwick says, you know what, let's shoot some, shoot some cosmic rays at a piece of wax. And when you shoot these cosmic rays at a piece of wax, you can cause the wax to basically sort of degenerate and shoot out these protons. Now, in doing so, you're left behind with a neutrally charged particle, a.k.a. the neutron. So as he bombards these, this, this radiation essentially under this paraffin wax, and he finds the protons are being isolated, and he can measure them, and he determines, you know, there is an actual another object sitting inside of the nucleus. And that other object is something that doesn't have charge. It's not adding to the charge, it's just adding to the mass. And so what does he do? Well, he builds on the nucleus. He says the nucleus is not just one whole entity. It's actually made up of smaller pieces, some of which are positive and some of which are neutrally charged. And the positive ones are coined protons or the atomic numbers are the pieces that actually give the element its identity. And the neutral ones, being neutral, are called neutrons. And so finally, we have a full picture of what the atom looks like. And so if we're summing this entire thing up from antiquity all the way to today, you can imagine for, you know, 3,000-ish years, we have this idea of just a generalized sphere for these individual pieces making up an atom. 
And then very quickly into the early 19th, or, uh, or sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century, Thompson figures out there's the electron in the plum pudding model. Rutherford builds off it and says, you know what? There's not positive goo. There's actually a nucleus where all the positivity is. Bohr takes it a step further and says the electrons are actually in these specific pathways. Schrodinger says, eh, not so quite. It's actually more complicated. And then there's this quantum view, and that's not super important to us. And then Chadwick takes it all the way to the end and says this nucleus, this blue dot in here, it's not just protons. It's protons and neutrons. And so now we know that atoms are made of three subatomic pieces. Protons and neutrons found in the nucleus, which have roughly the same mass. And then these incredibly light electrons, which have a negative charge, that are somewhere outside the nucleus in these clouds of probability. That's all we really have to understand at this point. And where we got there was a seriously long conversation involving 5,000 plus years of discovery.